If I have to summarize what I do for a living, uh, I'm actually in a translation business. So I move uh, in between of different bubbles and try to translate from English to English, from German to German, French to French, uh, Russian to Russian, whatever languages I speak. Um, because uh, my bubbles uh, very rarely uh, kind of, you know, mangle. So this is a bubble uh, represented in this room. Um, more or less, we are uh, same age. Uh, we are all in technology. We know how to spell um, coffee. Uh, and this is obviously not the blubbery stuff we drink, but something else. Um, I spend a lot of my time uh, in rooms full of uh, white men. Uh, over 60, uh, and uh, those men um, believe that uh, Hadoop uh, is something like a monster from science fiction, and Kafka is obviously a, a Czech writer uh, who worked uh, in an insurance company, uh, wrote um, highly dark novels, and uh, got completely uh, mad when the first phone was installed in his uh, insurance office. So um, tr trying to translate from one bubble uh, into another is uh, tiresome, uh, but I believe a noble task. Um, and actually, uh, my talk would be about such a translation and the necessity to apply leadership to this translation, because ultimately, uh, our society is evolving in such a fast movement that uh, certain things can't be captured if uh, we don't apply uh, leadership uh, to designing uh, safe and beneficial AI. So um, my talk uh, will be focusing around uh, a couple of topics. So first of all, I would love to get to a point where we have some common understanding on where we stand uh, in terms of AI. Then I will be talking about impact of AI on our society, and this is nothing which is kind of, you know, 20 years from now, or 30 years from now, but what is, has been happening already for quite some time. And I would uh, give you some um, kind of, you know, pictures on what I think is important in terms of social governance. So I uh, am on the advisory board of NASDAQ, where uh, there are 11 uh, public uh, board members from the U.S. companies, and um, so I sit on one of public boards of a very uh, traditional and old, uh, iconic U.S. company down in Bradstreet. So those things are being discussed there, but uh, small islands or small bubbles can't contribute uh, to heal uh, the overall picture. So where do we stand with AI? Um, there were a couple of uh, statements about uh, the singularity in this um, symposium. So it's very interesting because uh, Silicon Valley is not just run by um, computer geeks and Red Bull. Um, there are a lot of very prominent uh, people with formation of um, so, um, uh, physicists. And uh, for someone who has a degree in physics, uh, they have very different view on what life uh, implies. Uh, and basically, uh, life is nothing mysterious uh, for those people. Uh, this is nothing like, you know, some divine uh, hand uh, which uh, provided those carbon atoms with some stuff, but it's just uh, information processing. So information processing and living organism being computing entities, uh, having obviously hardware and software. And uh, when uh, those people think about life, in our universe, they believe that uh, approximately around of the mid of the 21st century, uh, we might be capable to upload uh, what we call today our mind into uh, another substrate, because uh, in such life forms, um, the mind and substrate are independent from each other. So um, they believe that um, the mind uploaded in a kind of a computer or whatever, uh, a device might look like, will feel exactly the same as, uh, for example, in my body. Um, and uh, this is a very interesting discussion because uh, it involves questions on how do we design certain things, how do we think about certain things, and what is the outcome uh, of certain things. So um, the guy uh, here uh, in the picture is uh, uh, Mark Stegmark. He's a fantastic uh, physicist. Uh, he teaches at MIT. 
and he uh, researches a lot about AI. He just published uh, a very prominent uh, book uh, called Life 3.0. He's talking about three uh, stages um, of life. So the first stage, Life uh, 1.0, is obviously what was uh, governed by the law of Darwinian evolution. So there were some bacteria, and then you know some organisms which were multi-cell organisms. But uh, those organisms just process certain information. They could not give additional software uploads to learn more than they used to be uh, in generations and generations. Life 2.0, uh, according to Tegmark, um, and this vision is, by the way, supported by Mark Andreessen, who is a physicist himself, um, is what we constitute. So people sitting in this room or running around on the streets. So we have our hardware, which is a blob of stuff, and then we have our software. So uh, just imagine blob of stuff like a watermelon, and what is the difference between a watermelon and, for example, myself? Uh, the difference is uh, that uh, my blob of stuff uh, is um, organized according to certain patterns. And uh, those patterns uh, could be described according to the laws of uh, software. So, and my uh, organical software can be upgraded because, for example, if I want to learn uh, Chinese, then I just go somewhere and I take uh, courses in Chinese, and so my brain, my software gets uh, an addition uh, of this knowledge of Chinese. And if I want to learn a violin, then uh, my software can get upgrade uh, in learning violin. So this life point uh, 2.0 is uh, very remarkable because uh, it's not just that we uh, can uh, proceed and evolve uh, and uh, reprocreate, but we can redesign our own uh, software. And uh, in this stage uh, where we are currently in, um, something uh, is happening because we see uh, first steps that it's not just the redesigning of software, but the organisms and living organisms can redesign hardware as well. And uh, this is what is actually leading us to the stage of life 3.0, where um, uh, creatures uh, will be on a much more progressive stage of the evolution, and this life might arrive in the 21st century. So uh, this vision is actually supported not just by some physicists, but by a historian like um, Harari. So Yuval Harari uh, is, is an Israeli historian uh, who published a number of uh, fantastic books. I recommend really uh, all of them. And he's saying that um, this century, the humanity will not just look outward, uh, for example, exploring new geographies, uh, new countries, but the humanity will look inward, exploring what does it mean to be an organism. And humanity will create new life forms new computing units, new units to process information, to reprocreate, and to sustain. So uh, this is kind of, you know, huge vision. Uh, interesting, what does it mean uh, for uh, us muggles, uh, and especially for people who are not now in uh, this room, but who are sitting in some boardrooms and in some uh, corporate, uh, on some corporate floors. And uh, actually, uh, these people are more concerned about advances uh, in artificial intelligence. So Trent uh, rightly pointed out uh, there's nothing mysterious about it. Uh, we have a bunch of computing power, which is very cheap nowadays. And um, we have old algorithms. So uh, AI today uh, is basically about mathematics from the 40s and 50s. Uh, and 60s. So what is on the right um, corner uh, of this um, picture, uh, those uh, red um, boxes, it represents deep learning. So the couple of tribes uh, in deep learning, um, there are talks about uh, Swiss um, uh, people around uh, Schmidt Huber who um, develop uh, long uh, short uh, memory, which is an essential technology for everything which powers our devices like smartphones. So uh, we have uh, British AlphaGoist, so uh, I think pr pretty everyone here heard about um, DeepMind and uh, what technology is behind uh, DeepMind. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, they are Canadians, uh, with Hinton uh, being a very prominent representative of uh, deep learning school there. Um, and uh, this deep learning uh, is eating uh, machine learning for uh, breakfast right now, and this is the most kind of, you know, state of the art, uh, what is going on 
in uh, uh, machine learning nowadays, but uh, even here, we have some question marks. And Hinton, for example, who developed the whole uh, theory about backpropagation is saying, mm, maybe this is not the best way to, uh, to, to do learning because uh, all those labeled data and stuff, a human mind doesn't learn like this. A child doesn't learn like this. So maybe we should just uh, put everything away and start uh, from a new. Uh, we need uh, a new solution. And if you listen to um, a couple of people at DeepMind, they actually agree uh, with what Hinton is saying here. So um, Paul Allen, uh, who is a co-founder of Microsoft, is saying that uh, we just have to understand human cognition to further progress in AI, and we are still not there yet. Uh, so this cognition, uh, this is really that we understand only small, small particle on how a human brain uh, works. For example, we know that there are neurons, and uh, we know that uh, neurons spikes, but no one has uh, whatsoever understanding why, why those neurons spike. So, and this is tremendously important to understand how cognition happens. Um, but there are some uh, interesting activities uh, financed by venture capital and by uh, prominent leaders uh, of the uh, industry. So, for example, uh, DeepMind um, uh, has uh, Develop a so called PatNet, and this is about teaching a neural network with many, many, many users um, and uh, then enabling uh, to reuse uh, parameters of teaching. This is highly important. And by the way, my question, which I will refer to on the later stage of this talk, would be who are those users training such a PatNet um, for a better performance? Then we have Vicarious. Vicarious is a very interesting company. Uh, so if you have like a list of prominence in the valley, um, then all uh, shiny founders will be found uh, as a, uh, investors in this uh, company. The company is very, very quiet, uh, doesn't talk a lot uh, in uh, many events, and they um, try to uh, better understand how cortical networks are working and um, um, getting patterns uh, for this. Then we have uh, Numenta, which is trying to reverse engineer the neocortex. When I was uh, CEO of Qualcomm in Europe, um, I was uh, kind of you know, dealing with uh, what was going on here. And uh, an interesting thing is that uh, Qualcomm tried to replicate uh, certain uh, brains uh, and neocortexes of different uh, creatures. So they were capable in 2013 to replicate uh, a brain of a bird, which is already highly complex, and after the brain of a bird, they moved uh, to an eye of a wasp, uh, which is a very complex uh, um, feature in itself because um, eyes of uh, those insects have multiple, multiple sensors to react uh, to, uh, to the surrounding. So, but uh, still, we are in the very, very beginning on understanding uh, the brain, understanding whether uh, kind of, you know, emulating the brain might be the right uh, thing to do to get to a better level of artificial intelligence. And uh, in uh, my personal uh, kind of, you know, belief system, I think that uh, without uh, quantum computing, uh, universal quantum computing on scale, it will be tremendously difficult to uh, leapfrog uh, generation and generations of, let's say, weak artificial intelligence. And we don't have universal quantum computers right now. What we have um, are co-processors. And uh, the problem is not hardware, but the problem is how we uh, think about software. And the problem is that um, in traditional computing systems, um, software is kind of a deterministic. But in quantum world, uh, we need to think uh, in a probabilistic uh, kind of way because uh, nature is uh, highly probabilistic and uh, there are different stages uh, to describe uh, certain things. So um, we are still a long way to go before universal quantum computing arrives at scale. Um, there are companies investing into it. Um, all those companies are either in China or in the United States. I've just heard that Siemens uh, discontinued his uh, quantum computing efforts, and uh, those efforts were actually funded by the European uh, Union. So this is something I totally can't understand, because, uh, you know, uh, 
saying prominently we are an industrial leader in a, a high power country, Germany, and discontinue such efforts, this somehow for me it doesn't uh, match. So, but all together, um, so uh, uh, Jan Lekan is saying that uh, despite all advances, we are still at 5% what AI can do. And still, this 5% are causing an immense disruption across uh, all layers of our society. So, um, what does it look like, this disruption? Um, so, newspapers and TV stations just love um, to report about um, robots who are taking our jobs. Uh, I must admit that I believe that my friends uh, in robotics um, are being portrayed uh, in a very negative uh, kind of way because, frankly, most of roboticists uh, are busy themselves to uh, create, for example, robotic arms which will then precisely grab an object and put it somewhere else, and this is already a very sophisticated engineering task. Um, the issue is not in killer robots, the issue is in software. And uh, at the end of Obama um, White House, uh, there were uh, three reports uh, of um, the scientific committee serving the Obama administration on AI and automation. And it was very, very clear that uh, automation and augmentation of human tasks and jobs uh, is arriving, uh, is being upon us, and uh, something needs to happen in the economy. So com companies need to cope, need to prepare. So the question is how. What happened actually, uh, Obama talked about AI in December in his farewell uh, address to the nation, and then he stepped down on the 20th of January, Trump came in. Uh, in February, he discontinued uh, fundamental research in AI programs. And now, just think back, uh, AI today is mathematics from the 40s and 50s, and by the way, Google is mathematics from the 30s. So discontinue fundamental research, what is going to happen uh, 20 years from now, question mark. So what he did as well, he didn't um, actually uh, position this uh, scientific committee as something which, is, which was helpful uh, for his administration. So this committee has 100 um, uh, positions, and only 30 of those are occupied. And this committee uh, started to deal with all kinds of questions on how to transition economy from, let's say, less AI to more AI. And this AI is even not that powerful. So we are still talking about this kind of, you know, 5% of what AI can do. So um, the question... Uh, why Trump is doing this, I think it's a little bit like uh, if you have kids and you, if you played with your kids um, hide and seek and uh, those kids were under uh, 20 months uh, old. What happens with such kids is uh, if you tell them um, just, you know, hide and I'm going to try to find you, then the kid is doing this. <coughs> and it's kind of, yeah, but you're not moving. But the point is that uh, new neurons uh, are developing quite slowly in human brains. And those kids, they maybe have four neurons, you know, which are functioning. So they believe that while doing this, it means that if they don't see, then we will not see them. And somehow some behavior in uh, certain governments, and by the way, in certain corporations remind me of uh, those 20 months old, uh, if we don't see, then maybe it will pass. So, and when uh, the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin in uh, March of 2017 saying that uh, nothing will happen to those jobs because of uh, AI and robots, uh, maybe in 50 or 100 years, then I get really, really, really concerned. So I'm trying to look to shine a beacon of hope in corporate. And then um, he's a very prominent uh, person uh, in uh, Europe and maybe uh, in the world. So uh, Kryan, he is the CEO of the Deutsche Bank. So uh, Deutsche Bank, Financial Times is reporting a couple of weeks ago, is firing a lot of people. Um, and actually, uh, Kryan is just being very honest. He's very well informed. He's saying in our banks, we have people behaving like 
uh, robots doing mechanical things. Tomorrow we are going to have robots behaving like humans. I mean, uh, cognition-wise, I kind of, you know, understand him in terms of leadership and giving your workforce uh, some guidance. I think it's a terrible message. But uh, this is coming out of the mouth of someone who is very well connected, is very well informed, can actually hire all kind of advisors, consultants, and you name them, can create uh, venturing funds, uh, invest in whatsoever, and uh, he thinks uh, such things. So he's making me cynical. And on another hand, we have uh, reports over reports on the evil Amazon killing jobs and destroying uh, industries. But in fact, Amazon, after having acquired Kiva Robotics and transforming it, they created more and more jobs, even uh, on the level of not software developers, but people working in uh, all those um, uh, centers, uh, logistic centers. And by the way, if you are a scientist and working um, on the North Pole, you can get Amazon Prime service delivered to the North Pole. This is because they increased the level of efficiency uh, to, to a fantastic um, stage. And uh, now uh, the company is growing, business is growing, and they can uh, actually uh, get more and more people involved. So um, another uh, issue, I think that even with small AI, we might get to a stage that people uh, might work less than uh, they used to be. But um, something like this was said already in the 30s of the last century by uh, one of the most prominent economists of the last century, uh, John Keynes. He was saying that technology trends in his time uh, would then uh, lead to the uh, fact that uh, people will work only 15 hours. So you know that this did not happen, but it might happen in 20 to 30 years from now. And in fact, uh, changes in workforce because of technology, it's nothing new. It has been there in uh, all civilizations. And uh, I mean, we just know that those small little AIs, those 5% of what AI can do, will outperform people in many tasks, in translating languages, in writing essay, in um, driving, um, in actually uh, implementing uh, some surgery. But at the same time, I believe uh, it's not technology that's killing uh, employment and uh, leaving those workers without uh, hope. I think it's lack of strategic vision, uh, incentive planning um, in the corporate and in government uh, for innovation. And I'm just asking uh, if AI is at 5% of its kind of you know, full uh, capacity, why not think about how trans to transform certain communities, uh, certain parts of economy to train AI, for example? Uh, so AI training uh, as a job, as a service, will be a huge business in my eyes. Uh, so I don't see one single initiative in Europe dedicated to this task. AI is a scientist, so certain tasks, certain experiments might be tremendously dangerous uh, if you are dealing, for example, with uh, synthetic biology, with some dangerous materials. Uh, AI might maybe step in and do certain things. If you formulate a problem, you might find a team to solve this problem, and part of this uh, solution might be AI. AI uh, helping to solve uh, environmental problems, or AI helping to plan for better cities for all of us to live in. So the point is not just uh, complaining about evil technologies destroying jobs. It's about stepping up and asking what kind of society do we want to live in and how to implement this technology so it enables us us, helps us, and gives us uh, new jobs. And actually, uh, I mean, I really love um, Andrew Eng, uh, who is uh, former Google, former Baidu. Uh, he uh, right now teaches deep learning to everyone who wants uh, to listen. He's saying that uh, to kind of, you know, capture the downside uh, of uh, workers, um, people, we need a basic uh, universal income. 
And uh, to give everyone upsides, uh, we need a better education. And this is totally true in my eyes. And uh, actually, informed people know that there is vast uh, amount of resources on the web where you can learn new things, new skills. But the point is that uh, the lifelong learning is not a part of a corporate life like right now. So this is actually leading me to the topic of education. And frankly, I am not really afraid that my daughter will face a robot teacher. In fact, if I remember my school, I would have preferred to have some robots teaching me instead of uh, certain uh, shiny representatives of humanity. So, uh, but uh, we need uh, to have a mindset that uh, education doesn't stop uh, after you received your maybe PhD or became a professor. And education is a lifelong task. So uh, humans need to get wired to have this implanted with, I don't know, mother milk or whatever you are on. You need to learn until you uh, cease to exist or get uploaded into whatever stage uh, we might uh, get uploaded. So uh, I perceive the work of corporation as tremendously bad here because uh, human resources is usually I call them um, police, corporate police, instead of people developers. I don't see those people being prominently positioned in boardrooms and in uh, top leadership teams. So they're talking about labor laws, about trade unions, about dealing with you know uh, some short-term uh, challenges. But I don't see that corporations are prominently discussing frameworks about uh, how to manage talent, how to give uh, employees room to learn new skills, how actually to uh, imply that everyone has to learn those new skills and what kind of models uh, of, of flexibilities um, in employment are out there to enable this uh, long-term uh, learning. So um, obviously, uh, we probably will face a day that uh, robots or software, you know, you don't need to have a Terminator in front of you, uh, will be our colleagues. And I think that uh, what will change as well, that when we assess uh, performance uh, in students, uh, that um, soft skills will be rated very differently from uh, how we treat them now. And now something which is really close to my heart. So this is Fei Fei Li, she's the mother of ImageNet. Without ImageNet, we wouldn't have uh, had this prominent uh, uh, state of deep learning now. So Fei Fei Li is a professor in Stanford. She's a, um, a chief science officer at Google Cloud. And she's saying that if we don't have uh, diversity uh, in teams training AI, we will uh, come to a very, very bad place. I mean, yesterday you heard this example of uh, dark uh, black faces being labeled as uh, gorillas. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a study on ImageNet about professions. So what came out of this study that women shop? So, you know, as a kind of, you know, call or, I don't know, divine obligation, women shop. Uh, obviously, all uh, users uh, of ImageNet uh, training the computer were m white men. And this is what uh, came out. So we need to have more diversity in teams, not just gender, uh, different experiences, uh, different maybe paths in life. Um, and Fei Fei Li is actually doing something about it because uh, she collaborates with Melinda Gates and they started to teach uh, girls uh, deep learning starting with the ninth grade uh, in school. Uh, so this picture shouldn't leave this uh, room um, because uh, here you see uh, from last summer University of San Diego graduation of a robotic uh, camp for kids and uh, this uh, um, little girl is actually my daughter. So now try to uh, extrapolate uh, 20 years from now. Um, so behind the United States here, it's San Diego, it's uh, one of the universities in California, and uh, you see this uh, robotic class. Um, we, we have only one white person, only one uh, female person uh, among those students, uh, which I personally believe is tremendously sad. Why she was in San Diego and not in Germany? Because I could not find uh, a class for her in Germany. and she. Somehow she has this idea, she wants to teach a robot how to sing opera. 
So uh, now uh, coming to something which is really scary, and this is uh, warfare. I mean, you don't need to have a Terminator to kill you. You just can have a drone, and drone is actually a bunch of smartphone technologies uh, bundled uh, in a nice way. And frankly, I don't care whether I'm chased by a Terminator or by a swarm of uh, drones uh, which have no mind and no conscious because they will kill me anyway. So um, something, something is happening here. Uh, drones um, or autonomous uh, you know, vehicles uh, are allowed to take decision on killing since May. Uh, of 2017, uh, there was uh, a letter of 126 um, experts, uh, so he's saying uh, 116, but actually it's uh, 10 more, uh, who signed the petition for United Nations uh, to discuss the subject, but uh, the uh, conference on this was postponed. However, last week United Nations created uh, a headquarter for AI with uh, uh, the base in, uh, in the Netherlands, what they're going to discuss there, I have no idea. I hope that something good will come out of it. And in terms of the surveillance state, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time that uh, China has already implemented the so-called uh, citizen score. So obviously every uh, single person is uh, tagged there and uh, they are data on this person. And according to those data, the citizen score um, the government might decide whether the person can relocate from one uh, city to another, can get a credit, uh, can be uh, um, actually received at some university, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what I would like to uh, say here that what Obama wrote in those three reports, Obama administration wrote in those three reports on AI is currently being implemented in China. So they, they just took those reports. I read the Chinese report. I read those three reports. It's more or less copy-paste. Uh, but uh, China uh, got uh, uh, tremendous amount uh, of funding behind uh, the AI initiatives. And they said that basically um, in 2030, uh, the AI economy in China will be um, 165 billion uh, US dollars. Right now, it's uh, 6.2. Um, so, uh, I must admit that uh, I'm kind of scared here, um, what is going on. And uh, every single consumer internet company in China, uh, like Baidu, like Tencent, has a military web de uh, lab dedicated to AI. So, uh, just to glance over, this was discussed yesterday. We have those uh, shiny companies uh, draining on data. But basically, uh, the slide here is that uh, from the point of view of uh, someone who sits on corporate board, uh, those companies are within top 10 of Fortune 500 of the most valuable companies uh, in the world because they have those data. And here we have a guy who is called the consciousness of Silicon Valley. He's Tristan Harris. He has a foundation uh, which is called Time Well Spent, and he would like to redesign, like a city designer, redesign uh, the web uh, to make it more human-centric. So he desperately needs partner funding, uh, you know, uh, voices uh, to take uh, his foundation to the next stage, and I think that this audience is uh, perfectly positioned to help him in his quest. And in my personal uh, view, um, to make a safe, a beneficial AI, even if we are still at this 5% of capacity, and of course it will evolve. We need a bottom-up uh, leadership and participation of all circles and bubbles of society. So if we have companies, and if I translate now to, uh, to directors, why don't you make AI as a part of your sustainability framework? It's not just about the environment and uh, your uh, artwork and communities. It's about uh, thinking how would you uh, actually implement universal uh, basic income uh, for your workforce or part uh, of what you uh, are providing right now, a salary, uh, to be transformed into uh, such a provision. Then if you are Google, uh, or Amazon, I believe that those companies have to have ethical uh, boards on AI. 
uh, three days ago, there was um, an article that DeepMind is finally opening up uh, its uh, ethic board uh, for participants of industry and research centers. I think it's a very good news, but of course, it's still very early. We don't know what, what is going to happen there. And in schools, I believe that every school uh, in every country needs to have some knowledge about what is going on in AI to prepare students um, to utilize um, online resources uh, to learn about AI and uh, to be involved uh, into AI discussions. And in terms of municipalities, I was uh, lucky enough to advise the city of San Diego uh, in their hackathons, and that was an amazing experience because um, all companies there opened their data to uh, participating companies. Uh, large tech co uh, corporations provided APIs, and actually out of those uh, hackathons, uh, we implemented five projects uh, uh, for the city for the better environment. Um, so it was a combination of uh, IoT and AI. So I think that uh, municipalities could step up with very easy frameworks to get into the discussion and to learn about it and actually starting to implement uh, things uh, for, for the better future of all of us. So I uh, just scratched on the surface on what might be the talk here uh, today, but I think that uh, this translation between bubbles and asking questions on uh, what does it mean to have good governance? Or what does it imply if everything will be embedded with AI? For example, human-centric design versus AI-centric design. All those questions are tremendously important. And uh, if I personally donate money, I uh, donate it to, to education, so I support Khan Academy and a couple of other um, foundation. And I think that we need to change governance anyhow from being backward looking to being forward looking to implement technology thinking and increase technology literacy in all uh, the layers of our society. But unfortunately, like some humanists and rights are teaching us that uh, people can't understand new ideas if their uh, livelihood depends on the old ones. Um, I mean, this is a not very optimistic note, maybe it's a very realistic note, but this is what I wanted to give uh, to you today, and uh, I'm open up for questions. Thank you, Anastasia, for this really inspiring talk. We have one time for one question, the chosen one. Hello. You, you talked about universal basic income, as everybody did, and then later on you said, yeah, they expect X amount of revenue or market size and whatever. And I don't see the challenges as technological challenges and not even educational either, but because it's the, the structure of society that needs to change. Okay. AI is gonna replace like 90% of the workforce and these 15 hours per week, the guy that said that, he said probably the same as you said, we're going to have that in 30 years, but we didn't get it, and why didn't we get it? I think it's all due to just power and greed. Look, I, I have two responses to this, because this is a very important remark. Um, so the first response is that uh, we have uh, examples in the history of humanity where people didn't learn by trial and errors, but just planned. For example, NASA ga um, got uh, Neil Armstrong and his colleagues uh, on the moon, not because uh, those you know, people were lucky, but because they planned and planned and planned and implied some scenarios and thought about what might go wrong and planned and executed. So why did I show you this uh, singularity curve? And of course, I mean, we can discuss in the break whether it will happen in 80 years or in 100 years. Frankly, right now, I don't really care. What I care about is what we are doing today because future is more important than the past because we can do something about the future today. Uh, I can't change the past, but uh, I can try to do something to uh, contribute to a better future. Uh, education for me is tremendously important because uh, tech literacy is not part uh, of uh, any uh, corporate CV. So, for example, if you are um, a board uh, director, um, it's absolutely nece necessary that you know how to read a balance sheet. And you might not be a certified accountant, but you still 
know how to uh, read uh, financials. Why on earth shouldn't those people understand what deep learning is about? They don't need to program, I don't know, uh, convolutional artificial networks or stuff, but they need to somehow understand that those things exist without uh, running out of the room if uh, some IT frameworks are being mentioned. Um, and this education can happen only gradually. Uh, um, I think we still have maybe like 20 years before it might be too late. But uh, with planning, uh, we can get to a stage where the world will benefit from AI instead of uh, new race and inequality and uh, then, you know, voters doing this uh, and voting for some... Uh, horrible people um, with a lot of power. Uh, so there should be some incentives. Uh, if the incentive is like uh, with the environment, uh, this kind of you know, idea of sustainability, then I'm totally for it. I don't have uh, complete answers. Uh, I talk only about very small steps. But demanding certain governance uh, is a key. Um, imposing certain governance uh, is a key, because as Trent mentioned yesterday, um, designing without governance uh, doesn't mean that there will be no governance, there will be bad governance, and this is what is unfortunately happening right now. Thank you so much.